Jesus paid the price, now I'm free from sin. I am so loud. My mind is made up. I am so loud. My mind is made up. I am so loud. My mind is made up. But God, He never left my side. He's my comfort through all hurt and pain.
Nothing compares. God is so amazing. I'm up here to do announcements, but his spirit is so powerful right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you Lord. Thank you, Jesus. God is doing a work. And if you want to be part of it, Wednesday night Bible study is where you need to be. 
Amen. We're still in the book of Mark. Yes. But more than that, we're learning and teaching each other how to do a Bible study because we need to be able to do that. We're disciple makers. We're here to make disciples. So be at Wednesday night Bible study. Learn how to do a Bible study together and have a good dinner. I heard from Siraj in Nepal this week. He had some gallstones, so he couldn't go on a trip. But we prayed, and, and God's taking care of his gallstones. But he gave us a phenomenal report. His best bud, Pastor Karen, it's, that's the guy's name in, in, uh, in Nepal, he went into this Mugu region where they've gone before, and they've seen hundreds of people come to Christ. On this trip... They saw 50 more people come to Jesus. They baptized 20 people. He sent pictures. They're baptizing people in this, this shallow stream. It's clear as can be. It's all snow runoff in the Himalayas. Ice cold. They're getting baptized in ice cold water. They're hungry for Jesus. And... Because Charlie had a heart for missions. And Deb said, let's do something about that. Forget flowers. Give money to missions. And so we've got money to send to Siraj this week that will purchase over 100 Bibles. <laughs> if they have a Bible, they share it with the whole family. That's nine or ten people. So we're going to be able to get some Bibles in the hands of these new Christians in the mountains of Nepal. The pictures are amazing because it's a wilderness. They fly and they hike through the snow to get to these places. How can you be more involved? Well, we have a missions conference coming up. All right, everybody, on your feet. Come on. Get them up, Kevin. Get them up. Holy Spirit, activate. Holy Spirit, activate. Holy Spirit. Activate. Holy Spirit. I love that. <laughs> Activate your gifts for ministry. You can sit down. This conference is all about you. It's about looking at your gifting from Christ. It's about your personality. It's about what your passions are, what you like to do, what you are doing, and pulling all that together to see how you can best do that in the kingdom of God. It's not changing who you are or asking you to do something different. It's about being comfortable with who you are and speaking boldly the name of Jesus in the streets and loving people. Often that time comes out in hospitality. Often that comes just with a cup of coffee or what you're doing every single day. But it's about discipleship. So Saturday, March 26th, Sunday, March 27th. Please put that on your calendar. Ask for those days off. Please be here. Because as a fellowship, you're part of, part of the body of this fellowship. Each part of the body needs to be effective. If I were missing this leg, I'd have a hard time walking around up here. We need each other. Tom, we need each other, right? What would this be like if we didn't have each other? It, we would be lost. Missions conference, be there. Also, we are doing some missions trips this year. Um, the dates are going to be not going to be set uh, because they're going to be specific to our church. So if you are interested in going to Honduras, see me in the next two or three weeks. No longer. Two or three weeks. That's all you got. Pray about it. Let me know. If you're interested in going to New York City, New York City? New York City. We're going to do a couple small trips to New York City also. Sound good? Yeah. Amen? Amen? All right. Let's take up the offering. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to give back to you a portion of what you've given us. Multiply it for your kingdom and for your glory, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen.
was such a lovely day. The sun was shining bright. The gentle winds were blowing my way. Not a storm cloud Some hills to climb 
And I've had some weary days And some sleepless nights But when I look around And I think things over All of my good days outweigh the bad days I won't complain. Sometimes the clouds hang low. I can hardly see the road. I ask the question, Lord, why so much pain? Oh, but He knows what's best for me. Though my weary eyes, they cannot see. So I'll just say, Thank you, Lord. I won't complain. God's been so good to me. Yeah, He's really been so good to me. Yeah. More than this old world could ever be. been there? I can hardly see the road. And I ask the question, Lord, why so much pain? But you know what? He knows what's best for me. Yeah. Though my Just say, thank you, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord, I won't complain, God's been so good to me, yes, He's really been so good to me, more than this old world. He really is so, so good to me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.
He's so good. Is the Lord good to you? Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow of where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. You are good. Good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, thank you, Jesus. He is good. He's good. Praise the Lord. Let's go to the book of Zechariah, chapter 4. Thank you, Jesus. I appreciate each and every one of you that are here today. May the Lord richly bless you for being here. Really and truly, I've already gotten a whole blessing. Literally, if y'all just all walked out right now and said, let's go home, I would still have gotten a huge blessing. It's just been such a powerful move of the Spirit all morning long. I'm so thankful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know that song that we just sung, uh, I Won't Complain, is it the antithesis of the entirety of the Old Testament in the way that Israel treated God. There is nothing that messed God up and made him mad like a complainer. You called it murmuring. Murmurers, man. The Lord would get so worked up over he'd be like, I'm going to blast them. And I love that somebody recognized that all the good things and the bad things really can work together for my good if I will trust him and be grateful in the process. Thank you, Jesus. Zechariah chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. An angel that talked with me came again and he woke me up as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? And I said... I've looked, and there's a candlestick all of gold with a bowl on top of it and seven lamps thereon and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof and two olive trees by it, one on the right, one on the left. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, You don't know what these are? And I said, No, I don't. Then he said, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts have sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? D.W., they better not despise small things. Woo! For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. And this is what I want to talk to us about today. Hashtag small moves. I looked it up. There's not a hashtag that's small moves. We're going to start something, y'all. Mama always said, Joe, Mama always said, if you don't start nothing, there won't be nothing. We're going to start something. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your sweet presence, for the power of your spirit. We're so grateful, Lord, that all we have to do is step out in faith and you do the rest. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We want you to stir up 
our hearts, Lord, that we would understand that we need to move. We need to move. Jesus, we need to move. When you say move, we've got to move. And we've got to move in your direction. Lord, we ask that your anointing would keep us and help us along our way. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Jesus. Y'all remember that old song? You got to move. You got to move. Y'all remember that at all? You got to move. You got to move. When the Lord gets ready, you got to move. You got to move. You got to move. It doesn't have a lot of words to it, but it has a great sentiment. You got to move. When the Lord gets ready, you got to move. Mm. Who hath despised the day of small things? Well, we, we despise small things all the time. You know, sometimes, have y'all, y'all have probably not even noticed this, but almost everywhere you go now, at the door of every business, there's a box of brand, brand spanking new free masks. And a lot of y'all don't even pick one up. Just despising the small things. It's free, man. You just take one home. You stick it in your pocket and take it home. <laughs> Y'all don't care about my jokes, and that's okay. That's not required to get to heaven. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Sister Bridget is getting the victory back there. Thank you, Lord. Do you know that the Lord is building his church? He's adding to the church daily. That's the word of God. From the very beginning, he's been adding to the church daily. He's been added to, adding to us daily. You know, we learn something every day, whether we want to or not. We learn something. God is building us, and he's building his character in us, and he's drawing us along the pathway to somehow find deeper, closer relationship with him and some of us are actually like open to that and moving in that direction. Some of us are like, I don't know what this weird feeling is, but I don't like it. That's just the truth. Sometimes we don't like what God is doing. But in this passage of scripture, God is revealing to his people. He's saying, look, I'm going to rebuild my temple, my house, because it's my house. And he said, you don't even have to worry about the mountain. The mountain don't mean nothing. I'm going to flatten it with my hand so Zerubbabel can set a headstone. He was like, I've already got all of this ready, all of this ready to go. Now, those of you that were here last week, you understand that what God is working in us here, this local body, is that he's moving in us, in these little ways, that's going to make big results. We just have to be obedient. In the documentary, Contact, Jodie Foster and Matthew McConaughey. She grows up. Her mom has died in childbirth. She's raised by a single dad who then passes away from a massive heart attack when she's only like 10 or 12 years old. And then she's an orphan and she's living with family. But during that time that her dad is raising her on his own, he teaches her to love looking at the stars and listening to the, to the shortwave radio band, right? Y'all remember shortwave radio? You know they still use those? Can you believe that? All of the technology we've got, and they still use them. In fact, there's one, there's one band that's on a Russian frequency that it does the same, it has made the same sound since like 1960. And so when they tune into it, it's like, bang, 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 just the whole time. It does that the whole time, right? So it's almost like a reserve channel for the military to use in case other communications go down, right? This, and shortwave radio operators will tell you it has always made that sound. But it changed last week. Now the bam, bam, bam is still there. But someone has hacked into it and they think it's a joke because what was playing over it was the Rick Astley song, 
Never gonna give you up, never gonna let you down, never gonna run around and desert you. Someone rickrolled a Russian shortwave radio. So that's crazy, isn't it? Anyways, so in this movie, one of the things that her dad teaches her when she's listening to shortwave radio bands is you can't just like run through these channels, right? Because there, there's channels that, depending on the weather, depending on what the atmospheric pressure is, sometimes you can get short wave band lengths from way far off. And so whenever she would get a connection, she would write down, she would put a pen in that spot where, you know, on her map of where it was. Oh, I got this all the way from Alaska. And she would tie a string from her position all the way up there because, wow, that's amazing. But one of the things that her dad would constantly tell her is small moves, Ellie, small moves. Meaning you don't, you just don't go cranking it. You got to ease through there. When you're looking at the stars and you're looking at things that, that no one else has discovered, looking for things that no one else has discovered, you can't take in the macro. You have to bring it on down and look in a specific area and then just barely move, just barely small moves. It's in the small moves that there is a great big discovery waiting. Yep. And so as the documentary unfolds, she has this understanding that there's got to be life out there in the galaxy. Otherwise, what a horrible waste of space, as Carl Sagan said. But she did not believe in God because what is the proof of his existence? And you will have to see the movie to see the way God reveals himself because it is amazing contact. What I want to take from that is it is the small moves that God is calling us into because for too long, people of God have been convinced that it's got to be something big if we're going to do it for God. I don't have time to read an entire book of the Bible or an entire chapter every day. I'm going to make a promise to you. If you will read one verse of Scripture every day, it will literally change your life. And you know what positive reinforcement does? It encourages people to do that more. I don't have time to pray for an hour or a half hour every day. Pray for a minute and a half. There's some of you that are thinking, that's no good. That's too small. <laughs> are you kidding me? Is there anything smaller than a God particle? Everything smarts with, starts with something tiny. And what God is looking for is he's like, hey, I'll do the mountain flattening. You step out with a stone. Look at in 1 Corinthians. Now, if you read the books of 1 and 2 Corinthians, you will find that Paul was very self-conscious, particularly towards this congregation. He was very very intimidated, kind of. And he mentions that in this passage of Scripture. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, he said, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. That's a weird thing to say. Did you know that in 1990, when they launched, I believe that's when they launched the Hubble Telescope, they had a certain idea of how quickly the universe was expanding. And it's a really big number, really fast. And then in 2016, they realized they were wrong. They were wrong. The universe is expanding much faster than what they thought. And they don't know why. And so all these scientists are trying to like do these discoveries to figure out what they missed over the billions and billions and billions and billions of years that the universe has existed. Literally, they wrote, there must have been something we missed (laughs) 
I think I know what it was. He uses even the foolish things to confound the wise. If anybody ever tells you they know everything, even if they're a teenager, they don't. It's not true. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 28, he says, And the base things of the world, or the basic things, and the things which are despised, hath God chosen, yeah, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. That's weird. Invisible things. That's weird, right? God is so strange. Why? That no flesh should glory in his presence. Do you know that God is looking for someone willing to make small moves? There's some people that are like, well, I'm going to turn my life over to God when I, get, when I get to a point in my life where I feel like I need him. I don't really need him right now. Life is pretty good. I got a good job. I'm getting a paycheck. Got a car. Got a place to live. Can make my bills long as the IRS don't catch me, I'm good to go. <laughs> I'm so scared now, Tom, about you and the IRS, because you're the only one laughing about that, and I'm scared. <laughs> he, said, Shh. he said, don't tell nobody. Mm. I literally had people say, not yet. You know, that's Well, that's what Paul was told. You know, the Lord gave him this great opportunity, and he's able to share his testimony in front of the governor and and in front of all these high officials. And one of them says, man, what you say is really compelling. Like this whole Christ thing is amazing. Almost, almost you persuade me to be a Christian. Almost. Almost. Listen, if you're on the fence about Jesus, why don't you consider making a small move in his direction and see what happens? Just see what happens. You move, make a little small move towards Jesus. He has this way of every little step I make, he takes a giant step towards me. Whoa. Hallelujah. At first I thought I couldn't trust him. Because God is weird and he does things like sending people on the mission fields. And you know what I'm saying? Like you, you start thinking about, well, living for God kind of makes you sound like you're going to end up spending every waking moment in the ministry or something like that. And you're like, I can't do that. I'm not going to be a preacher. I'm not going to be a missionary. I'm not going to do any of those things. Have any of y'all had that conversation with God ever? No? In fact, it's fine. I don't mind. Me and Debbie, that's great. Thank you, Deb. You are the best. I love you. So me and Debbie, basically, you know, concerned that God is going to do something with us that's uncomfortable and awkward. Should I trust him? Can I trust him? But this is the thing that I've noticed over time. And you, to be fair, you may be looking at what I do now and say, well, he got you. You sure enough, God, you pastoring now. This is not a compelling argument. If you don't want God interfering with every part of your life, it is a compelling argument because I thought I couldn't be happy if God was in complete control of what was going on. I forgot that he had so much experience. <laughs> and as I started making small moves in his direction as a young person, So you don't realize this, but I was super shy when I was a kid, and I was scared to death of people. I was telling Colas this when we were coming to church this morning. I was so scared of people, and I would just kind of hide behind my mom. I'm not talking about just when I was like a little six-year-old person. I'm talking when I was like, you know, a five-foot-eight, 12-year-old. I'm standing behind my mama going, I can't talk to them. Mama's like, you go out there, and you greet those children. And you invite them to Sunday school. You know, mama's like yellow green eyes can be piercing. You go do it. I'm like, please don't make, I would cry. 
please don't make me, Mama. Please, I can't talk to those kids. I remember my friends inviting me over for a sleepover. And I said, I have to ask my mom. And I told my mom, I said, please say no. I can't go over there. I can't go over there. She's like, what is wrong with you? It's going to be fine. You're going to have a good time. I did not believe that. I did not. I was so scared of people and so shy and introverted. And I don't know what happened. I do know what happened. What happened is, is that I started making small moves in the direction of the Lord. And the Lord said, I am so excited that you are so terrible about interacting with people. That's what God does, right? Moses is on the backside of the desert and is 80 years old. So he's mature. And he sees a burning bush and the Lord speaks to him and says, I want you to go to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And Moses says, that's a terrible idea. I have a stutter. That's what he told God. He's like, I can't talk. I would be terrible at that. I don't, I don't think this is a good idea. But look at what God does, okay? God says, I'm going to give you some help. He doesn't say, I'm going to have someone else do it. And the reason that God doesn't have someone else do it is because he wants you to do it. It's not by might nor by power but by my spirit, saith the Lord. He doesn't use things that are good at it. He doesn't use things that are perfect. He doesn't use things like that. He likes those things that are not. He likes those basic things that struggle a little bit because they don't know what they're doing. He's like, oh, I'm using you, Moses. You are terrible at this. I'm going to be so glorified when this is all said and done. I'm going to be so glorified. And do you know that God said, I'm going to give you help. I'm going to have your brother Aaron help you out because he speaks very well. But I'm not going to speak to Aaron. I'm going to speak to you, Moses, and you're going to have to tell Aaron what to say. Wait. Shouldn't you just remove me from the process entirely? No. And nowhere in Scripture does it say that the Lord called Aaron to go to Pharaoh to tell him, let my people go. He was there. He was a spokesperson. And nobody talks about how inept and uh, incapable Moses was. They talk about how great God was. How great God was. Paul was so like weirded out by these Corinthians that in the second chapter of 1 Corinthians, he says, uh, And I, brethren, when I came to you, I didn't come with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. In other words, I, I didn't come to you with a, something impressive. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. In other words, the only thing I was going to focus on is on Jesus. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Now I'm going to tell you something. When someone says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling... That does not sound like a confident person. That does not sound like a person that is standing on a pillar of faith and is pointing his finger. It does not sound like the person who turned the known world upside down with his preaching and with his letters. It sounds like us. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of men's wisdom. Isn't that great? It is great. It is great. It wasn't with enticing words of men's wisdom. Well, why not? Because where's the good in that? But in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. 
He said, it wasn't what I was saying. It was, I didn't argue you into understanding what Christ's death meant. I just came to you. I talked about Jesus and the power of the Holy Ghost just moved in and touched your heart and opened it wide and you were able to receive what God had. Do you understand that that's what Siraj is doing in Nepal? Siraj did, oh, he did not go to seminary. Siraj is not a trained public speaker. He's just a guy who has a heart for God and for the people, his people, in Nepal. He doesn't come from a wealthy family. He doesn't come from someone who's able to say, here, you just go and do this. It's not like that. He just had to step out in faith. And God has been so gracious to use Mark and Kevin and our missions team to be an encouragement to him because there was no way that he thought, hey, I'm, because of who I am and my background and what I have, I should go into the mountains and, and preach the gospel to those who have never heard the name of Jesus. That didn't happen. Instead, he's talking to the people that love and pray for him, and he's like, man, I just feel like there's a lot of people up there that, that really are hungry for Jesus. And they say, well, why don't you go up there and talk to somebody? Small moves. Just go visit somebody. What would you do if the Lord spoke to your heart and said, you got neighbors, why don't you just step out there and visit somebody? No. A number one, they'll think I'm a Jehovah's Witness. A number two, I'm scared that they might be a serial killer and open the door and shoot me. We're afraid of things like that, right? But imagine this. You're in your yard walking your dog or you are, maybe you're raking the leaves and your neighbor happens to come home and get out of their vehicle and you have this one moment to say, hey, how you doing? I'm doing good. And start building a relationship. Everything starts with, hey, how you doing? <laughs> Everything starts with, hey, man, what's going on? No, you're not going to be exchanging the deep things of your life to your neighbor the first time you meet them. Although I've seen God do that too. In the weirdest places, the Lord has just been like, Whew. And you find yourself sharing a story and they're like, I needed to hear this. And you're like, how weird, because I was just here to get milk, you know. But you have to start somewhere. And it's in those small moves, church, that God moves into the midst and things that looked so impossible. Do you know how impossible it seemed to Zerubbabel to rebuild the temple? The temple, Solomon's temple, there was nothing like it ever before or since. And he's supposed to go and do it. And him and Joshua, the priest, are like being spoken to by the prophet Zechariah. You know, and, and it's like, I, I, don't know, I, don't, I don't know how to do this. I'm not an architect. I don't have the wisdom of all ages like Solomon did. And God said, why don't you just pick up a headstone and take one step? And that mountain, that big old mountain that thinks it's something, I'm going to go, whoa. And you're going to be able to walk straight across flat ground. That's what God does. Remember when, when Moses, you know, they, him and Aaron, they have all these conversations with Pharaoh and there's ten plagues. And, and it takes time. Like there's things that happen. But when Pharaoh finally says, get all of your stuff and get out. And so all of these Israelites, you know, a million plus people, Gathering up and heading out. People don't move quick. They don't move fast. 
They're moving. He changes his mind. Let's go get them. He goes, and as the song says, they were trapped at the Red Sea by that mean old Pharaoh and his army. They have water. They have Pharaoh. And God's great idea was fog. And you might say, that seems about useless. Well, you haven't been in that kind of fog before. I remember one time I was up in the mountains on my motorcycle and it was over towards uh, Robbinsville or beyond and I, I rode up into a fog, a fog bank and I couldn't see anything. I mean, I could, I could see my front tire. That's all I could see. It was, I mean, it was pressed in around me. It almost was like, it was tangible. Like you could feel this fog around me. And I thought, wow, this must have been what, what was happening all around the Israelites. Because literally, I slowed so, 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 so much down because I was, if something had been in front of me, I would not have seen it. And you couldn't hear anything. I don't know if you've ever been in a really dense fog, but it doesn't just block your sight, but it absorbs sound and you can't hear anything. Everything is silent. Even the sound of my engine was almost non-existent and it felt like I had gone into this whole nother plane. It was absolutely bizarre. And this happened to the children of Israel and Pharaoh's army. And all night long, they couldn't get a hold of the children of Israel. And you know the story that Moses stretched out his rod and the sea rolled back and they walked across upon dry ground. And we tell the story as if they got to the Red Sea, he threw his rod out and they all went scuppering across and then Pharaoh gets out there and he and, he and his army drown. But there was some time it took. And we don't like the time that it takes between our small move and God's sovereign move. But that's where faith is really birthed. That space in between. The space in between where I was and where he's taking me to. That's what Ellie's dad was trying to tell her. It's so small moves. Don't get in a hurry. Just take those small moves and see what happens. What if God wants to do something amazing? Oh, wait. He does want to do something amazing. Okay. What if God wants to use you while he does something amazing. That would be crazy. What if in the midst of a bad day, God wanted you to take a small move of faith to say, regardless of what the circumstances look like, I'm about to be grateful for this bad day. Thank you, Jesus, for this incredibly terrible day. And then you say it a few times so it's no longer ironic. It's true. Imagine God moving in the midst of that. Imagine God moving in the midst of a grateful heart that is acknowledging, I don't really like what I'm seeing. I feel like I'm in a fog and I can't, I can't see what direction to go. I can't see where the enemy is. I can't even see where my friends are, Lord. It's okay. Small moves. Small moves, church. Small moves. Well, what kind of small moves could he be calling us into? He could be calling us into faithfulness in something small. 
I said earlier, if you would just commit to reading one verse of Scripture a day, the Lord will bless that. And that's the thing that people overlook all the time. They think that if they don't do something significant, that God doesn't see it. He doesn't have any time constraints. He can see every second that you waste on Candy Crush. You know what you can do while you're playing Candy Crush? You can play the audio version of the Bible. I can't do two things at once. Yes, you can. You do it all the time. Not well. You start with small moves and see what God will do. You start when you wake up in the morning and you roll over and look at the clock. I don't know if y'all do this, but when I roll over and look at the clock, I then think, what day is it? (laughs) Oh, man, nobody thinks that. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Thank you. Oh, my God. I think that because there's different things happen on different days. And so I need to know what day it is. And so I'll roll over and I'll think, what day is it? And some days I get there quick, and some days God is saying, get there quicker. (laughs) Come on, it's Monday. Mondays you go to work. It's like a process. I have to like work through this. I swear, I have not done drugs. I don't know why my mind is like that. It's just, it's, it's a lot going on, I guess. Seems like an excuse. I know, Joe, I'm sorry. But I'll roll over and I'll look at the clock and I'll think, what day is it? And then this is a thing that's been happening to me lately. Is this moment before I hop up out of the bed, I think, what's going to happen today? What's going to happen today? And you might say, that's weird and oddly immature for someone your age. But the thing... The reason that I think that that's been happening is because Mondays don't all look the same anymore. Tuesdays don't all look the same anymore. There seems to be this space that has opened up in my life and in my schedule that someone may walk into my office and something is different or a phone call may happen that's different or an email that comes in may be different or a text message that may be different. And so I'm starting to realize, wait a second, so it's Monday, this is what I have to start out moving towards, now what is it that God is going to do? Because I don't know. He doesn't ever run his schedule by me, ever. So great. I never get to look at God's day timer. He's completely in control of his schedule, and I'm finally learning that I have time to be in it. I have space to be wide open to whatever he wants to do. And you might say, well, what does that even mean? Well, some days it just means I'm a little more aware when someone says, so I'm going to have to have a test. Um, You know, my blood work came back and they're going to have to do some testing. And in the past, I may have jumped right to, oh, man, that's terrible. What does it mean? What's going on? But now, I'm skipping over that part and being like, I wonder what God is going to do. Let's pray about it. I'm so grateful to have staff that I'm sure that some of them don't believe in God or or at least ambivalent towards him, but they don't care if I pray with them. They're okay with it. I haven't gotten turned in yet. <laughs> so that's good. And just let me pray for them. Let's see what God does. That may seem insignificant to you, but to the person who's afraid they have colon cancer, it means a lot. It means a whole lot. It's the small moves that God wants to work in. Stop waiting for God to show up in a blaze of light and speak to you like Saul on the way to Damascus. 
If it takes that, then you are going to have to walk that kind of road. You really want that? Why don't you go ahead and make a move in God's direction and say, wait a second, there's something that's pulling and tugging at my heart. I don't know why I keep showing up in this building with these crazy people and they sing songs I don't know and they talk about stories in the Bible that I've never heard and they try to string things together and oh, why do I keep showing up here? You keep showing up here because we love you and you love us. You keep showing up here because there's something that is speaking to the depths of your soul and you're curious to know what it might be that God is doing. Wouldn't it be an incredible adventure to go ahead and surrender to the God who formed the universe that is expanding faster than scientists thought? Space and time are relative. And it is thought that because space is expanding so fast that actually that time has really increased for us, but we don't know it because the things we measure time with have also been altered. In other words, if everything shrinks, okay, like if you're holding a ruler that you measure with and you and the ruler shrink, then you're still going to say, well, this is 12 inches, but it's not 12 inches anymore because you and the ruler have shrunk. Does that make sense? Roughly. Time is short. I tell my staff all the time, I have to put as much knowledge in you as I can because I might get hit by a truck tomorrow and I want everybody at AirVent to still have a job in spite of me getting hit by a truck. I actually say those words because that's, that's the way I want to lead my staff. I want to pour into them. I want them to be able to operate without me. That's my goal. Because I understand that we are not promised tomorrow. And yes, I might live to 70. My good-looking dad's already made it to 71. Boom. I mean, genetically, with my grandparents living into their 80s, I've got a very good chance of living a very long life. Or I could hit, be hit by a truck tomorrow. We don't know. So then if my last message to you on this earth is today, then I would say make a move, any move, a small move in God's direction. Amen. Any move in His direction takes some faith. Because when you're moving towards Him, you're saying, you must be real. So I'm just going to move a little bit your way and see what happens. I'm going to see what happens. It's an adventure. It's the greatest adventure on earth. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There is revival that is happening in you. And these are the things that I think the Lord is going to start doing. You're going to start with a little bit of faith and thinking, what's God going to do? Well, I can't really make it to Bible class on Wednesday night because I work. Watch it. On Facebook. I don't, I'm not on Facebook. I can't get on Facebook. Watch a Bible study from our channel on YouTube. And don't you flip and tell me you don't have access to YouTube. I will smote you right now. I will issue you a holy smitation. Start having a watch party with your household. You're like, what's a watch party? 
it's when you're like, okay, so at 6.30 Bible class begins, I'm going to watch it, you know, feel free to join me. <laughs> Everybody can do that. Somebody else is teaching the lesson. I've heard it on Facebook. Everyone is completely legible. You can hear everybody's input. It's really good. It's really good. Start with a small move and watch what God does in you. Watch what God does in your watch party. Do you know that Marianne has got people that gather together that we have never met before that watch our Sunday service? Hey, y'all. cool. That's awesome. You could start that way. You could start with that reading a verse a day, or you could go to Psalm 119 that is broken into these little eight verse sections. It's really, it's cute. It's like when you get those snack size packages that are individually packaged, you know what I mean? Like for the boys, you know, for their lunchbox, it's not like the whole package of cookies. It's like individual packages in little eight verse sections. It takes you three weeks to get through Psalm 119 and it's smack dab in the middle of the Bible. And by the time you get through Psalm 119, you're like, well, I'm going to tackle the next 10 or 15 chapters because they're all really short too. Boom, you've just killed a month in the word and you won't even believe what's happened to your heart in the meantime. It's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. What else can you do? Start saying yes. When Jed or Kevin or any of us are saying, hey, the church is going to go do this, start saying yes. I am going to go participate in that. Or if it's just at a time you can't participate in it, why don't you see one of us? I'm on the flipping board of ABCCM. They have so many ministries going on all the time. Do you know that they right now need someone at the VRQ and at Transformation Village, the women's ministry, to be there at 6.15 in the morning to put out breakfast items? That's it. Spend 30 minutes, 45 minutes putting out breakfast items. I'm telling you, you don't even have to have two hands to do that. You can do that. There's a thousand things that they need people to be involved in. They need counselors to sit down and listen to people. They'll even put you through a little training course so you know how. Oh, I don't have time for that. I don't have time for that, Pastor. But maybe just, just a small move. Maybe just a small move. Maybe you could just do something. Maybe you could think about the fact that whatever it is that you make as an hourly wage, you could take that hour and give that in service to someone else. This is a good one that everybody can do. You don't even have to leave your house. But if you leave your house, this, it still works. Imagine opening your eyes, rolling over, look at the clock, figure out which day it is, right? Figuring out which day it is. And then saying, I want to bless one person today. Well, how do you bless a person? Sometimes it's just your smile. Sometimes it's you holding the door. Sometimes it's you speaking something kind in a world that's full of unkindness. The Lord is trying to reshape us into a church who wants to be available to what he is building. He's not relying on your wisdom. He's not relying on your ability. He's not relying on anything except your desire to let him do his thing. Sometimes you can be encouraging to someone without even leaving the house. It takes at least one sit-up just to get out the bed. 
But man, if we could make those small moves in the direction of Jesus. Is there anybody who's ready to make some small moves? Anybody willing to open up to what God might do? Maybe you've been doing the same thing over and over again, and you're like, well, I'm not so sure this is what I'm still supposed to be doing. Maybe it isn't. Maybe the Lord's going to adjust that a little bit. Maybe he's turning the dial just a, just a little bit. I promise you he wants you to be connected to him. Thank you, Jesus. If you would bow your heads. Lord, I ask that you would touch each and every heart under the sound of my voice that whatever you're working that they would be open and sensitive to it and that they would recognize that right now is a time to make a choice in Jesus name These altars are open if you need to find a place to pray. If you need to be baptized in the lovely name of Jesus, we can do that here today. There are baptistry robes available and changing rooms. But if we could, church, if we could find a place for a moment and let the Lord speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. I'll say yes, Lord. To your will and to your way, I'll say yes, Lord, yes. I will trust you and obey. When your spirit speaks to me, with my whole.
you, Jesus. I could not help but think in the midst of that message, that powerful word, of all the small steps that I've taken sometimes alone sometimes side by side with Sister Douglas and how many times that I took a, a small step in the direction of God's perfect will and then retreat it and take another and maybe this time too and get cold feet and how patient God has been with me because even now In my eighth decade, I still, I still have to take it in small steps. And sometimes, even now, I'll back off. But God just continues. Sometimes I feel like a, a child that is just learning to walk. And mom and dad is, you know, they're, they're knelt down in the floor about three feet away saying, Come on, honey. Come on, honey. That's the way God does us sometimes. It's like, come on. You can do this. You can take a step. You have heard from the heart of God this morning. You have heard from the very center of His divine willingness to use each and every one of us. No, He doesn't call every one of us to stand behind a speaker stand or a pulpit, but He calls every one of us to stand in the center of His will. Amen. All of us know what it is to not be in the will of God, and many of us know how it feels to find ourselves finally there. And no matter how bad life gets, no matter how much trouble surrounds us, no matter how thick the fog gets when we can find ourselves walking in his will nothing else really matters let's stand together thank you for choosing to spend your Sunday with us and now let's give God praise. Precious Lord, we thank you, we praise you, we worship you. We lift up your holy name. Help us, God, to take those baby steps that will lead us into the center of your will so that you can use us to the fullest extent of your plan. For all humanity, we give you praise in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. Lord bless you. You are dismissed in the fear of the Lord. Greet each other in Jesus' name. Come back when you're supposed to. Amen.